Do you think there's a link between the rise of behavioral disorders in children and the changes in society, or is it just a case that we are now more aware? Oh, no, no. We're definitely destabilizing kids. There's no doubt about that. Women, too. Women are way more unhappy than they were 30 years ago. There's a, there's a huge body of epidemiological data on depression and anxiety among women. And women are far more unhappy than they were in the early 1960s. And there's all sorts of reasons for that. But, and children, well, we, all we do to our children, pretty much, much of what we do to our children is confuse them in relationship to their identity, and even in relationship to what identity is, we tell our children, and we're compelled to tell them this now, well, your identity is just what you feel you are at this moment. It's like, well, what do you mean by feel exactly? Well, we really haven't thought that through because all we're doing is feeling. And, and what do you mean by at this moment? Do you mean like this, this tenth of a second? Do you mean this minute? Well, we're not really being that precise. You see, yeah, that's for sure. You're not being that precise. And where did you get this idiot idea that identity has ever been subjectively defined? Try defining your identity subjectively with your wife and see how well that goes. <laughs> Can you just imagine, that's the argument. What I feel goes, woman. It's like, oh, that's going to work out well. It's like, no resistance is going to make itself manifest on that front. I mean, all you're doing when you're married, married, is I, negotiating your mutual identities. You're just doing that non-stop. And you either do that well, in which case you kind of understand each other and maybe you're both improving, or you do it badly, in which case, you know, you're at odds consistently and you can't exist together harmoniously. But all social relations are negotiations about identity and the idea that any given individual has the right or the opportunity to insist that their momentary subjectivity dominate the social landscape is it's so preposterous i really can't believe that we've accepted it so i know technically for example that that attitude literally characterizes misbehaving two-year-olds. That's the, the fundamental existential claim of a misbehaving two-year-old is what I feel now goes. And you might say, well, why doesn't it? And the answer is, well, how long is a two-year-old going to last if you just like bring him to the airport and leave him there? He's not capable of orienting himself across any reasonable span of time or in in a multitude of different situations. He hasn't got the maturity. He hasn't got the integration. He's got this reliance on an impulsive hedonism. And that, that does characterize two-year-olds, by the way, because they're not able to engage in social play. Not at two. That doesn't really kick in until about the age of three. And at three, if you're not fixated at the level of a two-year-old, then all you do is negotiate your identity. And even if you're a three-year-old kid and you're trying to play with another kid, you say, here's how you do it. Do you want to play? You don't say, you have to play with me because I want you to. It's like, you'll make zero friends with that approach. The kids will just abandon you and leave you in your isolation. And that's what happens to kids who make those tyrannical claims. You have to invite people to play. That's the hallmark of the play that leads to the development of social ability itself. And so the invitation is, do you want to play? And then the answer has to be yes, it has to be voluntarily given. And then the next question is, well, what would you like to play? And what that means is, it means this technically, what identity would you want to experiment with, with me, for the next span of time? That's what children are doing when they engage in pretend play. So maybe the boy asks the girl, would you, would you like to play house? And the girl says yes or, or not. And if not, well then it's up to her to offer a different game. No, I'd rather play tag. It's like, okay, we need to agree. And then we're going to assign rules. We're going to play tag, you're it. No, I want you to be it. Okay, I'm it, but then you'll be it if I tag you. 
It's like, okay, your terms are acceptable to me. And so then in tag, one child plays pursuer and the other child plays the pursued. And then they flip roles and they experiment with those identities. And if they're playing house, the boy maybe plays out the father or the cat, who knows? And the girl plays out the mother. And that's an experimentation with identity. And it's not only that the boy adopts the role of father and the girl adopts the role of mother, let's say, it's that they jointly adopt those roles dynamically in a way that supports the other's play and makes the whole game fun. It's very, very complicated and very sophisticated, as you know, because you have to play that game all the time with your wife or husband at home, and it's very difficult. And so to to adopt those roles, husband and wife, and to do that in a spirit of voluntary participation and play. It's a, it's a sign of mastery to manage that. And all of that's reflected in the behavior of children. And all of that's a consequence, by the time they're three, of their willingness and ability to engage in the social negotiation of their identity. Internet service providers operate like monopolies in the regions they serve. What's worse, many ISPs log your internet activity so they can legally turn around and sell that data to big tech companies or advertisers for a profit. To prevent ISPs from tracking your internet activity, protect all your devices with ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is a simple app that encrypts your network data and tunnels it through a secure server. Their trusted server technology makes it impossible for ExpressVPN's own servers to store any data. They're so confident in their no-logs claim, they even had one of the biggest assurance firms, PwC, audit their technology. ExpressVPN is incredibly easy to use as well. You just fire up the app and click one button. It works on all devices so you can stay secure on the go. And ExpressVPN doesn't slow your connection. That's why it's rated number one by CNET, Wired, and TechRadar. Visit expressvpn.com slash Jordan. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash Jordan and get three extra months free. ExpressVPN.com slash Jordan. And so, and now we tell children, no, you're just who you think you, you're just who you feel you are this moment. And if you feel that you're in the wrong body, I saw this horrible thing today, this, this animated cartoon, Mama Has a Mustache. And <laughs> it was made by Lupron, or sponsored by Lupron. That's the company that makes the chemical that chemically castrates convicted sex criminals and blocks puberty for gender dysphoric children. And the whole ad had, you know, giggling happy children in the background, which is so sinful that it's almost beyond comprehension. So, and these were little kids' voices that were being used, I don't think more than four or five years old, celebrating their dissociation from biological reality, sponsored by a pharmaceutical company that manufactures castrating chemicals. It's like, Jesus, what the hell? It's really something to behold. It's like, are, are we making our children's mental health worse? Yeah, we certainly are. Why do you think there's a psychological epidemic of gender dysphoria? That's pretty bloody obvious. And then that's not all. We tell our children that the entire human endeavor, especially if it's associated with ambition and vision and goal, is doing nothing but contributing to the apocalyptic and immediate demise of the planet. And for all the children who manage to escape that particular moral trap, especially the boys, we tell them that, well, if you have any leftover ambition after scrubbing out the guilt about being a planetary destructive force, then just remember that everything you do that's even remotely masculine is associated with patriarchal oppression. And so, Jesus, dismal. You know, it's so, it's so sickeningly untrue. So, a long while back, about 10 years now, I worked on a committee, it was a UN committee as a matter of fact, that was focused on something like the investigation into what might constitute sustainable economic development. I had my qualms about that, but forget about that for a moment. I did a lot of 
research for about two years, reading everything I could get my hands on, on the relationship between economic development and environmental degradation. Because there, are, there, are, there is environmental degradation. We've done a very stupid job, for example, of fishing out the oceans, and amazingly, amazingly blind and foolish. There are things we're doing that are stupid, there's no doubt about that. But one of the things I learned that was so cool, and was so... It, it filled me with such a sense of optimism, was that the data pretty much clearly show that the fastest way to environmental sustainability is to eradicate absolute poverty. Because as soon as you get people above about $5,000 a year GDP, on average, they start to have the luxury of taking a medium to long-term view instead of, you know, scrabbling around in the dirt, literally trying to conjure up their next meal, and they start to become concerned with something more like the quality of the environment, a word I hate, the quality of the environment in the broader sense. And so it's pretty damn obvious that if we wanted to save the planet, we could have our cake and eat it too. We could drive energy costs down to as close to zero as we could possibly imagine, manage. We could thereby help eradicate absolute poverty around the world. And the consequence of that would be that all those people freed from suffering from the ravages of absolute poverty would start to locally manifest their concern with longer term longer term, let's say, environmental issues. We could have our cake and eat it too. So why the hell wouldn't we do that? There's a question worth asking yourself for about 20 years. Why instead are we insisting that the proper pathway forward is to impoverish poor people by ramping up energy costs when there's no evidence whatsoever that that does anything but increase the carbon dioxide load, if you happen to be concerned about that, and drive people who are already struggling directly into absolute poverty. What the hell are we doing? I think the answer to that is, we're not that interested in saving the planet. We're interested in destroying the fortunes of those we are envious toward. And that's partly manifest in this radical anti-capitalism, let's say, despite the fact that capitalist free markets have freed more people from poverty in the last 15 years than have been freed from poverty in the sum total of human history to this date. And the data on that are crystal clear. I mean, why the hell do you think people in China aren't starving? Because of the CCP? Or because the utility of free market endeavor was so obvious that even the bloody communists had to figure it out. And so that's quite straightforward and obvious. And so, if you like the poor, then, well, why not help them not be poor? And if you could also make the planet a better place, a greener place, a more biodiverse place, let's say, by simultaneously making the absolutely poor rich, why wouldn't you just line up to do that? And it has to be something like, well, what would you say? A, a virtually demonic envy and spite. It's something like that. It's appalling. And we're certainly going to see how that plays itself out in Europe this winter. So, sorry about that. But, <laughs> but really, man, I mean, really. If you're interested in this sort of thing, Bjorn Lomberg has a great book. It's called How to Spend $75 Billion, which sounds like a lot of money, but is a drop in the bucket compared to the sum total of, say, international aid spending. He wrote a great book, took 10 years of research, then he rank ordered interventions on the international front that would alleviate human suffering. He determined where money could be spent most effectively so that the return in relationship to the alleviation of suffering would be maximized and laid out a whole strategy for multi-dimensional remediation of some of the genuine problems that confront us. It's right there for everyone to read. It's a lot more complicated than, you know, carbon dioxide is bad and the apocalypse is looming. And neither of those propositions appear, as far as I can tell, to be true. I, I, I don't know how many of you know this, but it's really something to know. Do you know 
that the planet has greened by 15% since the year 2000. So remember that the apocalyptic climate doom claim was that as carbon dioxide levels rose, the plant life in semi-arid areas would die because of the increased heat. So that was one of the claims, and so the planet would rapidly become less green. But actually what happened is that as you raise carbon dioxide levels, it turns out that plants, which live on carbon dioxide, by the way, are able to close their breathing pores because they don't have to, it's easier for them to breathe in carbon dioxide because there's more of it, so they can close their breathing pores. And what that means is that they conserve water better, much better, not just a little bit better, much better. And so what that means is that the Sahara Desert has been shrinking because the semi-arid areas along its fringe are now capable of supporting plant life. And semi-arid areas all over the world have been turning green. You can look at, go look it up online. There's the, the, the data on this are crystal clear. And so, how is that not good? The other thing that's happened is because of the increased carbon dioxide production, crop yields have been increasing dramatically. And so we can feed people more effectively. Now that's not good, of course, because the planet has too many people on it anyways, which is not the case, by the way. So and how do I know that? Well, look, let's say you're 50. So when you were 10, there were like 4 billion people on the planet. Now there's 8, which, by the way, is twice as many people. So that's more people. And now you might ask yourself, well, are people poorer or richer? And the answer is, they're way richer. And so, what do you conclude from that? Well, one conclusion is, more people equals more wealth. And why would that be the case? Well, how about more people, especially if they're educated, because now they're rich enough to afford education, means more cognitive capacity, more brain. And more brain means more innovation. And more innovation means the ability to do more with less. And so the idea that we're at the carrying capacity of the earth is the delusional and genocidal fantasy of demented Malthusian biologists. There isn't an iota of truth in it. And so 